All right, well, welcome to Mission of Grace. Glad you guys are here. Glad you guys have joined us online. Um, I'm going to read a couple of things. I know it's boring to be read to, but I'm going to read a couple of things I wrote down this week <clears throat> just for some of you. I don't know if it's for everybody, but it might be for you. So don't tune things out uh, up here or over there until uh, you guys have heard the whole message. Are you guys okay over there? Lisa? You guys okay? Okay. Anyway, if she wants to wander around, it's okay. I think most of us have had kids, grandkids. We get it. And it's okay as long as she doesn't hurt herself. All right. Well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about forgiveness today. Forgiveness isn't something you say. It's something you live. It's something you do. We can say I love you all day long. But if we don't show it by the way we treat other people that we claim to love, the question would be then do we really love them? A lot of people say, well, I love you and I love the world and I love people and I hope everything's going to be okay. But we don't, we don't show it by our actions. Same thing with forgiveness. A lot of people say, I've forgiven that person who hurt me. But you don't show it in your actions. It's like you're still holding a grudge. You still kind of hope they get theirs. You still resent what they did to you uh, in your utter inner innocence, perhaps. Or maybe something they did by stabbing you in your back at, at work. Or maybe saying something insulting about one of your children. And you still take it personal to this day. Yeah, of course you forgive them. You're a Christian. You forgive them. But if you can't forgive with your actions... Just like if you can't love with your actions, you can say it all day long and it means nothing. It's important to prove it to yourself by the really receiving the fullness of the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't just say he loved us. He didn't just say he forgives us. He proved it. He's still forgiven us. He's still alive in his grace and mercy operating in forgiveness and renewal he proves it but a lot of times like i say we get hurt and we feel like we got to keep being mad about it we have the right to never really let it go and we need to let it go because it's penalizing us let alone the light the very dim light it's reflecting on the person we say we forgive so uh, just like we can't fake love, we can't fake forgive. We might do it all the time, but the veil is thin. People know whether or not they've been forgiven. James 3.17 says, but the wisdom from above is first pure. I'm reading now the ESV. Then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere jesus walked in the wisdom of forgiveness the wisdom that comes from above is impartial it's open to reason it can adjust to circumstances even bad things that have happened we are still capable of forgiving and walking in the guidance and the wisdom of god it's the wisdom that comes from above it's a mature wisdom to live in the guidance of God. Yes, you might have to forgive your enemy. You might have to love your enemy. And you can righteously say it's not fair. But what's fair about the Christian life? Our need, our need to make everything fair as Christians has damaged the cause of Jesus Christ. We're so concerned about our rights our desires, our needs, us, us, us. And we feel so justified in fighting back because, well, that's the right thing. It's the American way. I'm doing it for this reason and that reason. The truth is it just displays a lot of pride and arrogance on our part when we can't submit and yield to the will of God. God says to forgive. 
And that's one of the hardest things in the world to do. It's easier to love than to forgive. But forgiveness is a sign just like sign, love is the sign of God in your life. So is forgiveness. Forgiveness is love. But boy, is it hard to do. Because people honestly could ruin somebody's life. And then that person as a Christian is asked to forgive them. It's totally not fair. But it's whether it's fair or not, it's the ways of God. God is that great. God is that awesome. You have that much of God in you. I have that much of God in me. We're capable of even forgiving. And I know people find that disturbing and, and painful. They want to forgive our enemies. Our enemies are no good. They're trying to kill us. They're trying to kill our family. Well, I'm not saying be a pacifist in your forgiving. I think it's instinctual. It's instinctual as creatures, as human beings made in the image of God. It's instinctual to fight back. If you sense danger and it's coming for your child, you're, you're not going to think about it. You're not going to take time to pray about it. You're instinctively made to defend and protect that which is yours, including your inner man. So it is not right to be violated in any way. And I'm not encouraging that we, we just stand there and take it like doormats being stomped on. What I'm saying is we walk in the wisdom of Jesus Christ. His, his life was propelled by the power of God within him. He was God. And that's what he, but he, he was man too. He could have let the man side of him take over. Many people wouldn't have accused him if he did. Because it seemed he was so terribly mistreated. And yet he continued to do what God asked him to do. He saw what God was doing. And that's how he led, it, led his life. And that's our calling. It's a high calling. But it, Christians were capable of doing it. Um, one who forgives is free. And because you're free, you're able to walk in that wisdom presented in James 3, 17. Which to me is one of the, there's so many great ones, I can't say it's the greatest. But it's a high, um, monumental, meaningful verse in the Bible you hardly even hear about. Seldom preached, seldom read. It takes great meditation. It covers everything. And when you're in doubt about seeking God's will and you're not sure what to do and what direction to take, follow the wisdom of God and it's what it looks like. Now you say you're a preacher, why aren't you using a Bible instead of just having it open before you? Because we've all got Bibles. I just happen to be reading the one out of my phone. So there's no excuses anymore when people say, well, I didn't know what to do and I got depressed and I got down and out and everything. Look it up. Go to your phone and go, what does the Bible have to say about depression? What does the Bible say about discomfort? What does the Bible say about anger? And you can read it for yourself. Everybody's got one. And you can read it in any language you want. Everybody's got one. So if you're all bent out of shape because I'm not reading out of this book, I am reading out of it, just reading out of it from the same source you might have. Matthew 5, 43 through 45 said, you have heard said that it was said, love your enemies. It said, no, love your enemy and hate. Sorry, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Verse 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your father in heaven. Well the great child of God is Jesus Christ. He's our oldest brother. He's our leader. He goes before us. And we're in receiving the same inheritance he is. We don't deserve it like he does. But because he died for us. He makes it open that you can be like him. You can see the world through the eyes of God. You can love and forgive even those who persecute you because God's in your life and you have that power. 
I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Some of you as children were bullied and persecuted. Maybe it wasn't because of your Christianity. Maybe it was because you didn't fit into the crowd. Maybe it was the color of your skin, your gender. I don't know. But instead of hating and, and defying and going against everybody, why don't you try loving them? Like this one thing about this gender thing and, and the whole idea of Christianity. That's fine. If you can prove God's in your life. And I don't mean you have to go any way to prove it. But there's so much hatred. There's so much venom. Everybody's so persecuted. But the onus isn't on some people to change. It's as much as for them to change in their hearts. If they're so hateful for their enemies, if they just curse them and beat everybody up for persecuting them, I don't see Jesus. So threatened, so defensive, so mad, so angry that people are judging. But okay, they judge Jesus. They're judging us. Who lands on the side of forgiveness, grace, righteousness, hope, the image of Jesus reflected through your demeanor rather than your personal human rights. It's about God in you. God's wisdom leading you. It's not about just you getting what you want. And if nobody else likes it, you're going to cram who you are down their throat anyway. Well, that's not Jesus. And if it's not Christian, we need to take note of it. There's a, people say, well, God's not going to return until there's an antichrist. There is an antichrist. Maybe it's not formed in a single person. Maybe it never will be. I don't know. But there's a lot of antichrist spirit running around. There's a lot antichrist being crammed down your kids' faces at school. There's a lot of antichrist attitude being spewed through local media and national media. I'm not saying people are bad people. I'm just saying that the spirit of an antichrist attitude is permeating our lives and we want to be safe and not be ridiculed so we better go along too we're not anti-christ but we're anti being the pushback and all that stuff keep it easy on yourself well you may not be anti-christ but if you're even listening and complying then something's not right because if you're for Jesus, you're for love, you're for forgiveness, you're feeling, you're for reasonableness. It's the Bible that says, come, let us reason together. Reason together. That's promoted through Isaiah in the Bible. It's not a new concept to come and talk and reason and work things together. And if you do it in the name of Jesus without some heavy handed mean-spirited attitude but in the grace of God people are going to want it because they see it and we as believers for a long time have failed to represent it to love our enemies looks like forgiveness we need to forgive those who've harmed us and are harming us how one is by repenting we need to change our ways we need to put our thoughts into actions. We need to stop retreating and try harder. Try harder in the depths of our guts. If we tell somebody we're sorry, or they tell us they're sorry, then we need to prove we're sorry. Or we need to receive and watch them without condemning them, without judging them. We need to test the fruit of their spirit. Are they serious? If I'm going to forgive somebody, then I need to watch how I forgive them. Do I mean it? Am I critical? Am I hard on them? Every time they make a mistake, am I going to jump down their throat? Or can I forgive them to a point to where I'm going to give them a break? I'm going to love them like 1 Corinthians tells me to love. Uh, uh, to love uh, suffers no long, uh, suffers long. It is kind. It does not envy. It does not 
parade itself. It is not puffed up. It is not rude. It doesn't seek its own. It doesn't provoke. It doesn't think evil. Here's the deal, guys. Sometimes we, we say we forgive somebody and then we sit and watch everything they do so they can prove to us they don't mean it. Yes, they should mean it if they say they're sorry. But on top of that, we should mean it if we forgive them. Maybe we're not going to trust them like we used to trust them. Well, that's part of the wisdom of God. Maybe we're just going to jump in every time they come up with a harebrained idea. Maybe we'll be a little bit more cautious. But the truth is, the onus is on us to forgive them. And it may take a while. Especially if we're going to keep a notebook on everything they do that makes us upset. We need to let them go. Wisely. If you start struggle to forgive and just can't or won't do it, proving it by the way you live, ask the spirit to reveal your inner man. What must you do to change to be more like Christ? We, we look at somebody who did us wrong and we go, when I see Jesus in you, I'll, I'll see a difference. But do you realize in the meantime, the, the, the onus is on you to forgive them? They still need to see Jesus in you before you see it in them. And that's a struggle because we're like, well, why do I have to make the first move? Well, if you believe in Jesus, you're not going to really care if the other person makes the first move. You're willing to do it. At the same time, when they do it and they're trying to do it, you're going to give them a break. You're not going to just keep saying, well, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's mean. And it's not Jesus who forgives. You can forgive. But you also need to prove you can forgive. The words are like, yes, I forgive you. Don't worry about it. But you're like, that guy's always late. That guy's always late. Forgive me for being late all the time. I forgive you. The next day, he's not late. The next day, he is late. And you're like that sorry son of a. Tell you what. I told him I forgave him. He doesn't appreciate that. Wrong attitude. If you're going to forgive him. You got to keep forgiving him. You got to mean it. Not just say it. And you go well, I don't know what to do. He's late all the time. It's just driving me bananas. You know the best thing to do is probably get on your knees. And say Jesus. What is it about me that this drives me bananas. Can you help me, God? Can you live through me? Because I know Jesus doesn't go bananas. And he's, if he's late coming to my house, he must be driving Jesus nuts. Oh, he's not? Okay, well, help me react like Jesus reacts. If you're going to forgive, don't just say it. Do it. There's nothing worse than living with somebody. No offense to you, Lisa. I don't mean her. But I mean, you know, living with somebody who says they forgive you, but they never forgive you. Uh, if they're not a part of your life anymore, they're deceased or their whereabouts are on unknown. Yes, it's even harder. I get it. Like maybe your parents did something really mean to you when you were a child. You've grown up being mad at them ever since. But they died when you were 20 years old. And you, you can't forgive them. Not really. You say you do. But in your heart, it's tough. Okay. Well, I think it's true. I think we can all empathize that it's not easy. I would recommend if you're really struggling with forgiving anybody, including those who've hurt you, that you can't even look in the eyes anymore. You know, maybe you need therapy. Maybe you need a little counseling. That's available. There's a lot of Christian counseling and therapy. There's definitely the ability to meditate on it. Really get in your heart of hearts and ask God to help you with it. Really, really pray. Meditate on the scriptures. Spend time thinking about it. Not just blowing it off every day and making it deeper and deeper. Think about it some. Give it to God. Uh, also, give yourself a little bit of a break. 
because we're being transformed according to Romans chapter 12 into the image of Christ, but it takes a renewal of our mind and our minds move a little bit slow sometimes. So let's give ourselves a break. Once it gets there, start dealing with it. I remember uh, when I was in the hospital after my accident and they came to me and they introduced a speech therapist to me and I said, well, I can talk. And they said, well, no, it's more for your, your brain. I thought well, there's nothing wrong with my brain. And I refused to believe I'd had a brain injury or whatever. So I sat there and go, no, nope, well, she can leave. There's nothing wrong with my brain. So every day she would come back and I'd go, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with my brain. It was irritating me. Why is this lady trying to tell me something's wrong with my brain? And she said, I'll tell you what, if you'll do this before tomorrow, I won't bother you anymore. I said, okay, fine. She came back the next day and she said, did you do it? And I said, do what? It was actually two hours. Okay. Two hours. <laughs> the problem is I didn't know I had a problem. And then when I started to figure out, wait, I'm not thinking very clear. I can't concentrate on anything I'm reading, blah, blah, blah. Then they told me, well, that's the sign that you've got a problem is that you recognize it and you want to do something about it. Well, that's true with us with forgiveness. Sometimes we just need to finally get to a place where we have to admit that's the problem and forgive, not just say it, show it. Be patient, be patient with your minds. It can deceive you. Don't, I know it's like, well, I, I know what I'm doing. Maybe you don't. You can get too ambitious. You can get too, this got to be straightened out. By golly, I'll straighten it out myself. Don't even do that. You're only going to mess it up more. Wait on God. Trust God. Be patient. Um, Matthew 7, 17 says, so everything healthy so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. If you're going to say you forgive somebody, but you're not actually doing it, then you're just a diseased tree that's fooling yourself. You're alive. You're hanging in there, but something's wrong if you can't put your attitude and your words into action. Forgiveness is an action. Love is an action. <clears throat> Faith is action. It's more than just words, thoughts. It's how you conduct yourself. First John 4, 1. Behold, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay, I'm breaking that down to very simple terms for us at this very moment, which is... If you're not bearing fruit, you're being a false prophet about the situation. You can see this. Well, I'm not very loving. I'm not very patient. I'm not very kind. I'm scared to death that I'm going to be run over again by this fool. I'm very scared again that I'm going to be taken advantage of. I forgive, but I refuse to do anything but say it. He's got to prove the difference. And the reason I say he is because I'm thinking about women that have been abused by men and the man says oh please take me back baby take me back and they've taken him back so many times they're just hard about it but if you're a christian you can't be hard about it if you're a christian maybe you shouldn't take them back many people have ruined their lives dealing with idiots who don't prove themselves they're making any changes if that's the case Get on your hands and knees and ask for godly wisdom. And if this guy's a threat to your kid, get rid of him. It's funny how people think, well, that's not the way of God. I don't want to be, I don't want him to be mad at me because I got a divorce. He's not going to be mad at you. But it's funny how people pray to God, but they only expect him to act in one way. The way they've seen or heard he reacted in somebody else's story. Why can't he react different in your story? If it complies with God's will, according to the word of God, it complies with God's will. 
If it's anything outside the bounds of this book, it's not of God. But people say, well, I got married. The Bible says if you get married, people don't even get married. They get together. They have a little ceremony. They have a big party and they say they're married. Marriage means commitment. Marriage means dedication. Marriage means if you marry the love of your life and she's in a car accident two days after you marry her and she can no longer function and her body is going to grow more and more ugly. Love and marriage means I'm with her till we die. You don't get to say, well, okay, now I'm going to go find somebody else. Not if you're committed in marriage. A lot of these people will say, well, I, I got married. We had a big party and boy, everybody felt good and it was awesome. And they go, but now he doesn't like me anymore. And we're getting a divorce and blah, blah, blah. But the Bible, I'm scared to death. God's going to curse me if I get a divorce. That's dumb, especially if you didn't really get married to begin with. If there was no commitment, there wouldn't be talk of divorce. Unless you made a mistake, like I said, and A, didn't really get married, and B, married a total imbecile who lied to you about who he was from the beginning, or she, and now you're stuck with dealing with it. But you know what that means? That means the wisdom of God, the counsel of God, the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. Through this, through people you love. It's not, okay, now that he abused me, I get to leave him. No, no, no. There's a lot more to it. Because God may use you to save that man's soul. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you something else. Common sense dictates if your children are in danger, get out. Instead of going, well, the Christian, you're miserable all the time. You hate your job. You hate your life. You wish you were somebody else. You wish you were a great singer and you're just this old person and you're unhappy, but you're scared to death to get a divorce because God might be mad at you. Do you even know God? You're unhappy anyway. If you knew God, he's going to do things inside of you you couldn't do for yourself. That's when you have a relationship with God. Not religious doctrine telling you a bunch of garbage you bought into that makes you an unhappy person. God is full of joy. He's full of strength. He's full of love. He's full of forgiveness. And if that's not operating your life, forget who you're married to. Forget where you work. Think about you. What's my problem? Because I'm not operating in the fruits of God's love and joy and hope and health and happiness. Sorry to break it down. I'm sure there's people, oh, 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 he's wrong about that. No, I don't think I am. Anything people do that obey God's going to cause them to obey this. Amen. Because God's not a liar and he's not going to mislead us. Maybe the problem is you're pretending to be something you're not. Because if you have God on your side, if God is on your side, who can be against you? Not the enemy, not hatred, not prejudiceness, not greed, not stubbornness. Oh, I'm stubborn. It's part of my bloodline. Like you need to change it through the bloodline of Jesus. It's no excuse to not live the Christian life. A lot of people need to set themselves free and forgive people no matter how hard it is. And they don't just need to say it. They need to practice it. And it's hard. But through, but what's not? Plus, through the power of God, you can do all things, right? Amen. Through the strength of God. Your joy is your strength of God. And if you just get down and out, you're always beat up and hate yourself. And you're just all the time a no good person who gets on your knees and prays, 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 prays. And nothing ever happens. You're, you're not walking with God. Because you're wasting time and God doesn't waste time. You've only got a little bit anyway. It's a beautiful gift from God. And the devil just wants to steal it from you. He's no good. He's mean. And if you act like him, you got to ask yourself, what's my problem? Man, we got to trust God. We got to trust God. We got to get down there in our spirit and go, what is it? Help me, God. Help me, God. 
Oh, and help me, God, not beat myself up because I don't understand what you're doing with me. Please, God, please free me from condemnation. Just help me. I'm being honest with you, God. I'm just messed up. I'm just messed up. I, I'm not even going to try to outdo it. Just help me. Please help me, God. And you know what? He will. If you're contrite, if you're humble, if you go before to God just raw and naked in your inner man, why wouldn't he help you? He will. He will because he's God and he's good and he's faithful and he's true. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Or is that just something that sounds good? But really when it comes to you. Eh. No, if you believe it, you'll go there. And God's worth finding. Anywho. Okay, well, that's enough. Um. Uh, Let's end with the word of prayer, Lisa. I'm going to end with the word of prayer and then you can cut thing, that thing off. But I do want to pray with you guys as well as everybody else. Lord, we come before you right now. We're asking you not just to bless us because you always bless us. But God, we're, we're going to ask for a specific blessing. Can you give us the ability to forgive, to walk in forgiveness and not expect people to prove whether they're worthy of our forgiveness or not. But that we'll just... We'll just prove we are worthy to forgive them because of you inside of us. Mm -hmm. Help us forgive God. Help us to walk in forgiveness. Help us to make love an action and not just words and things we sprinkle out there, but real action, God. Help us forgive. Help us love. Help us walk as you walk. Creative, open-minded, ready for anything. Because of you and what you might ask and want us to do. Help us say, yes, God, I'll do it. And then really mean it. Back it up with doing it. Help us, God. I pray for everybody here at Mission of Grace. I pray for everybody listening to us today. God, just help us through your grace, your wisdom. We humble ourselves before you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, guys. We'll, we'll go ahead and take up the offering. We'll let her get out of here because she's she's wanting to run, and we're totally keeping that from happening. Do you? Mind